Last week, we learned that in marriage, we become one flesh, and we learn how that's done spiritually and physically, and uh, that it's, that's the sacred moment of coming together in marriage, and that we should not separate, we should not let selfishness get in between us, but we should be one team. And so today, I wanted to take time to offer us some biblical instruction on how that, or what that looks like. What does one flesh look like in everyday life? And again, if you are not married, you know, take notes if you're longing to, you know, tie the knot one day and get a ring and say, I do. Um, or maybe we're in marriage already and we're just trying to learn and grow and be more refined in our marriage. I pray today would encourage you. Uh, we're going to talk about living as one flesh. What does that look like? I want to start a little bit in the deep end and then I'll come out of the shallow end and we'll just, you know, wrap it all up to help us. And I'm going to even share what it looks like in our home, in my home. Uh, just real quick disclaimer, our home is not perfect, okay? So if you hear, you know, some wins today, it doesn't mean we don't have many losses on the, on the way, um, but we thank God for what he's been able to do. I am shocked how much, or how, sorry, excuse me, how little marriage instruction is in Scripture for being such an important subject, um, the longest portion of scripture on marriage is in Ephesians chapter five. And it's 12 verses, that's, that's the largest we have. And so I, I found that interesting. So the Bible doesn't give us a ton of scripture of what it looks like to live as one in marriage. So that's why I wanna give you some examples from my own life and what I saw growing up in my parents' home. Um, and what Paul is gonna talk about in Ephesians five, the context is believers in marriage, not the world, but believers, godly people living in marriage together. What does it look like to have a Christ-centered marriage? What does it look like to have a Holy Spirit-guided marriage? If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start with verse 21. This portion of Scripture is the most that we can find. Um, the research on it is massive. This this scripture has created a lot of books, a lot of articles, a lot of opinions. Again, my overall goal though is to try to be practical and help us understand how to live as one flesh. Ephesians 5, verse 21. Uh, do we have, are we ready to listen carefully and, and receive graciously? You'll see after the first line why I'm saying that. Uh, many pastors feel very uncomfortable preaching this scripture because today, nowadays, people read into this in ways they shouldn't. Men have misinterpreted this. Women have misinterpreted this scripture. Uh, people have weaponized this scripture to demean women and hurt women and all those things. So uh, I just want to make sure I come at you with the truth of it and to the best of my knowledge and ability. And so your grace is appreciated. If not, my car is running. So, I'm just kidding. Ephesians 5, verse 21. I'm just a messenger, right? So, but I'm gonna be a faithful messenger to God's word. Ephesians 5, 21. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. See why I didn't do this on Mother's Day? I, uh, or Father's Day? Sandwiched it in between. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. Let's keep going before I explain. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church, and we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother 
and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Wow. If you are new to a biblical worldview, you could, someone could try to twist this, again, to be demeaning towards women, empowering men, but I assure you that is actually not the case here at all. Let's not, not let our current culture impose our views on this scripture and what everyone's talking about nowadays with men and women. Let's just get to the point of the scripture and make sure we honor what, what God meant through this. Paul addresses them as being in the Lord, meaning believers and how we conduct ourselves is now different from the world and how they would conduct themselves in marriage. Paul's audience is in Ephesus, so it's full of Greeks and Romans. There would be some Jews there as well. And in Ephesus, uh, this diversity of cultures, the background is that women were treated poorly. Marriage was treated poorly. There was a very low regard for fidelity. There is historical records that men had um, been married 23 times, 21 times. I saw one that said 10 times, another one that saw, said eight times. So, and this is women too. Women were getting married multiple times. Um, men in the Greek culture, they would use women uh, to, uh, for pleasure and they would go home then to their wives after their wives took care of their kids and took care of their homes. And uh, this was the, the poor treatment of women at this time. It was awful. So this is the, the background of what Paul's saying here is now that they're coming out of those kind of cultures where fidelity was, is not any longer, there's not faithfulness to marriage, he's having to drop some wisdom and instruction on how to operate um, in the home. So let me go further. Uh, the fact that Paul addresses wives first is actually something out of the ordinary. You would think that Paul would address the husbands because they're the head first. But what Paul's doing is, is Paul's actually elevating women here by addressing them first because usually they were not given good instruction. They were not taught, they were not even thought about being important enough to even share with them first what they should do. Paul goes into uh, only a few verses for women, but for men, he has more, and they needed a serious overhaul of how they're going to approach their wives now that they're Christians. Um, the men here that are listening to this would actually be taken back quite a bit by Paul's call to love and serve your wife the way Christ loved the church. Because the men in this culture would say, no, my wife should do all that and, and basically submit to me. And uh, it would be the other way around. So there would be a lack of respect for women. Paul is shocking, in other words. A lot of people read this and go, whoa. You know, that word submit is a strong word. The instruction to the men is actually really strong. Because he's saying, I want you to give your life your wife and serve her like Jesus served the church. So sacrificially put your wife first above yourself. So this is a hard call on men today. On men who are not married, who want to be married, and all husbands who are married as well. But we can't ignore the instructions that we have here for all of us. We all, verse 21 points, that we all should submit to God when we fulfill our roles. And we all submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Jesus gave up his life for us all and we learn to serve one another as well. I may have headship in my family, leadership, responsibilities, but I still have to submit myself to serve and love my wife. That's when my wife says, amen. <laughs> Even though I am over my kids in authority, I still submit myself to serve, raise, and train my kids. This is what the Bible demonstrates as servant leadership, not lordship. When Jesus was talking to disciples and they were saying, Lord, who's the greatest? He said, if you want to be great, then serve, not try to be a lord that's dominating over people serve. What did Jesus do? He washed his disciples' dirty feet before dinner. Why would Jesus do that? They didn't even want Jesus to do that. That was so 
uncommon at that time for the king of the Jews or the king of the world or the savior of the world to get on a knee and wash feet. Lord, let me wash your feet instead. No, Jesus was teaching us to serve and that is to be great and to lead. So you see in the kingdom of God, he ups, it's an upside down kingdom from what the world looks like as leadership and what Jesus calls us to be as leaders as men. Let's get into the, uh, the part of the wives. There's only a few verses for wives. And it says this, submit, your, your, or submit to your husbands as to the Lord. The husband has been entrusted and ordained by God. Notice, by God, not man. We have not self-appointed ourselves to be in charge of our home. In God's, in God's kingdom, he places us there to carry the sacred responsibility of headship for his wife and family. A wife in the Lord recognizes this, ordain, this is ordained by God, so she respects her husband's leadership and even helps as that suitable helper by carrying this responsibility along with him as a mother and caretaker. I just wanna say thank God for my wife. I could not do what I have to do without the suitable helper that God has given me. She's incredible. Single parents, I applaud you because you have to assume both. You have to assume leader in your home and caretaker of all things. You have to assume everything. Church, we need to take care of our single parents. We need to help them. We need to pray for them. We need to provide for them. We need to babysit for them. We need to step in and give them a break because they're having to take on both roles. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. What does the word submit here actually mean? It means to yield, to come under, to, to actually let the father or let the husband lead. In the Greek, it has this connotation, submission in the sense of voluntar voluntarily yielding in love. So the woman, the wife, volunteers to yield in love. Uh, I think about, I don't know about you, if you've been at a four-way intersection and no one goes, man, is that frustrating or what? And so, you know, a lot of times I'm like, just go ahead, man. <laughs> I'm going to yield, let you go. I just want to go. I want to get to work, you know. And no one's going because everyone's afraid, you know. And so uh, wives... You love and care for your husband when you allow him to go and lead, when you come under his leadership and respect that. And the husband does not command the wife to do this. That's key. The verb implies that she does this voluntarily. Submission does not imply that the wife is inferior. It does not imply that she's less intelligent or less competent. Christ submitted to the Father, but was not inferior or less God than the Father. Mm. Good point. Submission does not indicate that the wife puts her husband in the place of Christ. Your husband is not Jesus. Okay, don't worship your husband, first of all, because he's not Jesus and he can't fix all things. He has no authority uh, over Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit, okay? And gentlemen, we shouldn't try to, you know, be Jesus, but we can be like Jesus, okay? And we're gonna learn that in a second. All right, uh, Christ is supreme in all things. So the, so the wife does not give up independent thought. Submission never signifies that a wife gives in to her husband's every demand. And I would actually say, don't demand anything, husbands. Don't be demanding. Be a strong leader that leads the way by example. Be peaceful, be serving, be loving. Okay, if, if demands are unrighteous, she submits to her higher authority, Jesus. If you live in a home where the husband is not practicing this at all, maybe he's not a, a believer, maybe he's not living like Jesus and he's demanding of things that are not uh, holy or righteous, you answer to Jesus before you answer to him. And you follow Jesus's word, not your husband's word on that. It says lastly in verse 24, wives submit as the church submits to Christ. Wives yield, wives give their lives to their husbands as, as uh, the church gives their lives to Christ. So Paul uses this helpful gauge for wives to know what submission looks like. 
with this analogy, that church's submission to Christ, okay, all of us involves, we are loyal to Jesus, right? Faithful, devoted, pure, and loving. So wives, praise the Lord, be, be loyal, be faithful, be devoted, pure, and loving. And I've been part of a home that has been able to witness that, and it's beautiful to see. Thank the Lord. This represents the essence of what wives are to their husbands. I grew up in a home where both my parents were leaders. Ooh, those are fun. <laughs> and my mom, she did such an eloquent job of, of, you know, letting my father lead, even though my father is a very strong leader. You know, he was leader of this church for 40 years, and my mom's a very strong leader. But I would watch my mom digress. Okay, honey, you know, take, take the wheel, you know. And, and that was a beautiful thing to see, and you guys always handled that so well. I applaud you guys for that. So thank you for that, yes. And mom, you were loyal. You have been loyal. You continue to be loyal, faithful, devoted, pure, and loving. It's, it's fortunate to see, and I realize not, we, don't, we don't all see that. So that's why I've been trying to pour out some examples from our own lives so you understand and you can see it. Husbands, it's time to, it's time to talk. It's time for me to talk to you. All right, there's more verses for us. <laughs> and, I, and I don't want to come across like you're a punching bag today. Okay, men? I know we're, we shouldn't be getting punched like that and stuff like that. You know, if something convicts you, it's the Holy Spirit, right? It's the Word of God. Uh, we have a higher calling. We have, we have a very serious responsibility. You know, we have been placed in this responsibility by God. And just so you know, you cannot do this without his help as men. And the same goes with, with wives. We need Jesus to help us do and live out our roles. The, the scriptures really just go to the next level here and say, love your wives as Christ loves the church. That immediately just takes it next level of we have a serious responsibility on our hands to represent Jesus as well in our homes. This is what the full life commentary says. Notice that Paul does not stress the husband's authority over his wife, but his love for her. In our scripture, it, rem it mentions your love for your wife. The husband's headship or authority is not that of a domineering man who makes all decisions and requires submission by his wife. Rather, Paul carefully safeguards the dignity and well-being of a wife by defining her husband's authority in terms of the power and depth of his self-sacrificing love for her. Men, you are powerful and your leadership is incredible when you are laying down your life sacrificing your time and your life to love your wife. That is to be a man, is to love and serve your wife and lay down your life for her. And, and gentlemen, you know, if, if, if you're having a hard time following the long conversations you may have with your wife, that's sacrifice. <laughs> Tune in and don't do what I do. I, I try to fix things way too fast. That's a mistake. Just listen to your wife, love her. I, I, we tease about that in a lot of marriage retreats, you know, that husbands, yeah, husbands, we gotta hang out in the kitchen with our wives. Do you love her? Hang out in the kitchen with her. Help her, listen to her, right? And by the way, I don't know about, I've seen a shift though. A lot of men cook nowadays, right? So, you know, the point being is, <laughs> Who knows nowadays? Everyone's cooking, everyone's doing this, everyone's doing that. The point being is, gentlemen, if we want to lead and love, or if we want to lead and, and have, you know, the, to earn the respect in our home, then let's lead with love. And let's spend quality time with our wives and care for them. And let's get into that. We actually see four examples of Christ's love in the scripture. Paul is so, so smart. He's, he, it's the word of God, right? So God's leading and guiding him on what to put in this letter. But he, he focuses on four things. Sacrificial love, purifying love, caring love, and unconditional uh, unifying love. And so number one, 
gentlemen, we're supposed to show sacrificial love. I know I've already kind of come into that a little bit on a practical level, but listen to this. Christ initiated his love for us first. So let us initiate love for our spouses first. Let us show love first. If no one's showing love and we're in a fight, right? How many of you know? You get in a fight and no one's showing love, no one's showing humility, no one's trying to fix the issue. Gentlemen, I think that's on us. Ooh, boy. Ooh, honey, start the car. I got, the men are angry with me now. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. If, if someone has done wrong, either party should humble themselves and do the right thing. Don't get me wrong. But if we're at a stalemate, then be like Jesus and lead by example and sacrifice that. Wow. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, this is, this is the word. Christ loved the church, not that the church might do things for him, but that he might do things for the church. Jesus came to serve and not to be served and to, to not be great or to be great in the kingdom of God is to serve. He's calling us to lay down ourselves, our wants, our needs first for the needs of our spouse. Secondly, a purifying love. Jesus sanctified. He saved and he made the church holy, blameless, without fault. By the way, just so you know, you are forgiven and without fault in God's eyes because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But gentlemen, you can't, you can't make your wife holy and you can't save your wife uh, from sin if they're not a believer yet or something like that. And you can't make your wife holier. Only Jesus does that. Okay. Here's what we can do. What does it mean to have purifying love? Well, your relationship with God can be so strong that you inspire your wife and your kids to be closer to God. It sanctifies. It continues to help us be holy. It helps our, gentlemen, if we, if we are following Jesus first, our wives are gonna follow too. And some of you may be in homes where your wife is not a believer. Lead, follow Jesus. Let them see Jesus in your life, Right? Let Jesus be contagious in your life. It's the same way. Men, your life should inspire your wife to want more of God. If you're gonna be loving and obedient to Jesus, she's gonna want the same thing because she's gonna see the fruit in your life. Lead the way spiritually. How about caring love? This one's hard. Like I said earlier, oh man, you get home from work or whatever, you just wanna, you wanna plop on the couch, but you know, your wife wants to catch up. Hold on a second, a caring love. He talks about how you care for your own bodies, right? The way you would care for yourself. Well, oh, there you go. I want to rest. Well, so does your wife. I want, well, so, your wife needs that too. I've definitely been learning that I need to lay down my desires and needs and care for my wife. But you know what's beautiful is my wife sees the same thing and goes, hey, take a break, rest, all that good stuff. It's interesting. It's a beautiful dance together. Care for one another. Love that does not love and expect something back or only loves to get something in return. That's the kind of caring love that we show our spouses. Love that does not love expecting to get something back or only loves to get something in return. Can you love your wife because you simply love like Christ did? Hey, let's be real. There are times in marriage when we're not all firing on, on our cylinders, right? We're not firing on all cylinders. Our husband can get off, the wife can get off, and just get off track, just not doing well. And, you know, no one's showing love. It's a stalemate. I'm gonna go back to that. It's a stalemate. There's a lack. Typically, that means that we're off with Jesus a little bit. My wife and I, we practice this thing where we're allowed to be real with each other. If we're not doing well, and you can tell, okay? How many know you can tell when your husband ain't doing well? Uh, when your wife's not doing well, they're, they're not showing the fruit of the spirit, they're showing the fruit of the flesh, okay? Their mouth, you know, their attitude, whatever, short temper. My wife has, she is allowed to tell me, Ryan, I think you need to get with Jesus a little bit, okay? And, and I'm allowed to do that as well. We've built this, this love for one another. We care most of all about each other's 
relationship with God above all else. And we know that if we're off, then we're probably a little disconnected from our God who has given us the grace to love each other. I love what Matthew Henry says. Talk about caring love. Matthew Henry says, the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. Wow, that's powerful. From Matthew Henry. Gentlemen, let us learn how to nurture and love and care for our wives. And one of the best ways we can do that is listen, understand, and validate what she's feeling, what she's thinking, and also just spend quality time with our spouses, with our wives. Amen? There's an unbreakable love. I talked a lot about this last week, so I'll be brief here. A holy union and bond that is for life. Husband, your love towards your wife is likened to being united to her as the members of the body are united to each other. You would not consider separating a body part from your body, but keeping a whole. I like my arms, okay? I don't want these to be, I don't want this to be dismembered from my body, okay? I don't want my wife and I to go separate ways. We are one body, okay? We are one flesh. We are one person now. We are married together. So I don't want to do things that would hurt her. I don't want to be severed from her. I want to nurture and care and love and keep that unbreakable bond that God has called us to keep. Amen? So love in that way. I have a very good, very powerful explanation of what headship looks like on the website. It's by the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, and it offers a great biblical explanation of the husband's role of headship. I'm quickly running out of time, so I just want to encourage you to see that. If you want to learn more, gentlemen or wives, or husbands or wives, you want to learn more about this. Um, let me just give you a, a little piece of it real quick, okay? Uh, this one really sticks out to me. The husband leads like Christ, being considerate of his wife with respect and knowledge. He considers the ideas of those he leads because they may be better than his own. Leadership's goal is not to show the leader's superiority, but to elicit all the strengths of people for the desired objective. Wow. Headship is not male domination, harshness, oppression, and reactionary negativism. Now, you know, what I'm hearing here is, is that Jesus with his disciples, he, he elicited their giftings and abilities. He knew their strengths and weaknesses, but he formed an amazing team. In my home, my wife has strengths that I don't have. And I have weaknesses in those places, and my wife has strengths. So as a good leader, we look for the abilities in the home, and we elicit their help to, over, to um, accomplish the objective who wants to win in marriage? Who wants to have a winning family? Who wants to have a winning marriage? Who wants to thrive and overcome things? So what does a good leader do? Okay, a good leader or a good quarterback uses the gifts of everyone on the team. He knows them and he puts, he, he understands what they're good at and utilizes their abilities. By the way, um, we're not the coach, gentlemen. God's the coach, all right? We're just on the team. But we might run uh, QB, just so you know. He's a little sport analogy. Okay, let me uh, start laying the plane, come out of the shadow end, shallow end, okay? There is a ton of research on this subject. We're running out of time, but I just want to encourage you to hear me out on this next portions of this practical advice. Uh, first of all, let me make an appeal to all gentlemen and all husbands in the room, all right? If we're going to be the husbands God designed us to be, we really need to know Jesus, don't we? I mean, if you think about it, did I not break down the ground rules? I forgot to break down the ground rules in the beginning. Husbands and wives, no elbows during the sermon. <laughs> Some of you guys have bruises already. Uh, I got an elbow stuck in my rib right now. Okay, hear me out, gentlemen. We believe that the love of Jesus is the greatest love in the world. 
And all we see in this scripture is that men are supposed to love like Jesus. So gentlemen, we really do need to know Jesus, don't we? And not just knowledge, but a relationship with Jesus. We need Jesus to live in us through his Holy Spirit so we can live or show the fruit of Jesus in our lives. So gentlemen, I just wanna encourage you. First of all, one, you can't do this on your own. You need to have a relationship with Jesus, a salvation relationship with him, believe him as your Lord and Savior, and then walk with him and allow him to teach you and give you the grace needed to love your wife. Okay, now ladies, especially single ladies in the room who are on the hunt, okay, you're searching. Is that weird to say like that? Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're not, yeah, I guess we're not caribou. Men aren't caribou, you're hunting for. <laughs> this fly is hunting me up here. Okay, anyway, you're searching, okay? Ladies, you believe that the greatest love in the world is Jesus. Do not settle. I know it's slim pickings nowadays. Okay? I know. But ladies, look for a love like that. Look for a man who knows Jesus personally, relationally, and lives like Jesus. Okay? If you can get to know that kind of man before marriage, what do you think he's going to be like in marriage? Hopefully, he stays that way, right? That's the point. So I want to encourage you ladies to not settle, not lower your standard. And gentlemen, let's rise to the occasion, amen? amen. Let's rise to the occasion. If we believe in the greatest love, let's show the greatest love we can to the women around us, especially in marriage. Okay. Yes, praise God. All right. It's okay to clap. Yeah. All right, let me close with our home experience and just some encouraging words to end with here. My wife and I, we try our best. I try my best to, to, to lead in such a way that it shouldn't be hard for her to follow me. In other words, I wanna be a respectable man, a trustworthy man that it's easy to follow and easy to yield to and easy to work with in the home. I'm not perfect, but I try my best to do that. I remain in fellowship with God so that I can have constant reminders and help from him to live the way he wants me to live, not the way my flesh wants to live. I strive to show my wife the love we learned about today and I try to demonstrate the fruit of the spirit. Um, my wife, she's a joy to serve. And again, I said this earlier, we're not perfect, okay? All right, especially me. My wife is a joy to serve because I love her and because she is careful to show appreciation and help me with this great responsibility. She really does an incredible job uh, being a full-time mom, wife, and full-time teacher here at Calvary Christian Academy. And she does a fantastic job helping me be a husband, a father, and a pastor. Um, secondly, we take one flesh seriously in marriage. So we do everything as a team. I mean everything. There are a few things, okay? But most of the time we're doing everything as a team. Why? We know each other's limits and we know each other's strengths and weaknesses. And when she's exhausted, sick, or needing a break, I step in and do what she would do. And when I'm exhausted, sick, or need a break, she helps step in um, to help me out. We all know that, right? That's common sense. We help each other out when we're sick or going through things. How about, let's get real on the surface here. How about grocery shopping? We're a team. We're a team. I mean, I don't know how else to explain it. We both grocery shop, all right? And to be honest with you, I cook the, most, I cook the majority of the time in the home. So I'm, my mom showed me how to cook kind of just by cooking in front of me and we would hang out in the kitchen, hang out and talk. I'm a little bit of a mama's boy, I'll admit that, okay? All right. <laughs> my wife always says that. Uh, look, I learned how to grocery shop because I went with my parents. I went with my dad to grocery shop. I like going with my dad to grocery shop. He got everything we wanted. <laughs> that was fun. My, my mom, she was like, no, we don't need that. <laughs> we already got one. Cooking, hey, my wife is my sous chef and she's really good at it. 
She helps take care of everything. You know, I'm, I'm cooking the chicken, the steak, burger, whatever. She's cleaning up everything. She helps dice things up. On Memorial Day, we had my parents over and we just naturally just snapped into our roles making chicken fajitas and she was taking care of the counter, getting everything ready, prepped. I'm making the meat. Next thing you know, I make the best tacos in the world. My mom says they are so good, she wants the recipe. Which, if you don't know, this, the backstory to that, I said one day on Mother's Day that my mom makes the best tacos. Apparently, I make the best tacos now because she wants my tacos. So, that's pretty cool. All right, household chores. Gentlemen, ladies, we just want to get it done. You know, hey, I'll do the toilets. I don't want to. Lord knows I don't want to. In my neighborhood, we have hard water and gross water for some reason. So, you know, things are turning orange in our showers. And so I'm in there scrubbing hard and the showers, tile, everything. But guess what? Why? We just want to get it done. We work as a team, right? I don't want my wife doing all that by herself. She already had a long week. So I, I step in as well. She, she does her thing. Uh, leading our kids spiritually, disciplining our kids. We got to be on the same page. Parents, you got to get on the same page together when it comes to disciplining kids. Don't let them get in between you two, okay? Look out. Running errands, hey, we both do it, all right? And discipling our kids, leading them spiritually, we both minister to our kids. If I'm, if I'm gone and late for a meeting, my wife will lead the way with devotions or prayer, whatever it may be. We both do those things. There are some things we don't do. Uh, just so you know, it's our personal conviction that we have all of our finances in one account because we believe we are one flesh. Okay, so there's no secrets between us. All right, now if we want to surprise each other, it gets a little tricky, right? So we got to pull out cash and then we find out the reason why. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out why my gifts are a little cheaper than her gifts. I'm some, <laughs> no, I was just, I'm just kidding. But overall, I oversee the finances because we moved to online. But before, she was really good at getting all the bills out. Now all of our bills are online, all right? My wife oversees something I dread overseeing, our personal calendars and our kids' school calendars and ministry calendars. I got this calendar to look after, you know what I'm saying? I got the church's calendar and all of our ministries. So when I come home, I don't want to deal with another calendar. Well, my wife said, I got that, and she's really good at it. Really good at it, and I appreciate that. Um, my wife cuts the grass, takes the trash out, and washes my car while I watch her. Nah, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I am just kidding. Man, it got real quiet in for a second. Oh my goodness. Nah, we've been, grac we've been graciously blessed with people to cut our grass because I have terrible allergies. I used to cut our grass all the time. I'd be done for three days, and it's time to cut the grass again. So thank the Lord for that. But no, we just take turns getting things done. And so, of course, I wash the car. I wash the cars. Uh, my wife has a little height issue on the car thing. So I, I go ahead and do that. But she's good at cleaning the inside. She is. All right, lastly, decision-making. Oh, this is the fun one. Who makes the decisions? If he's the head and he's the leader of the home, who makes? We both do, because we're one flesh. We're one team. We make decisions together. And if we don't know, guess who takes the initiative to do the research? I do. Because if we don't know, I need to assume the role of making sure I do the research for the well-being of our family, especially financial decisions on investments or buying something for the house, the yard, the car. I will do serious research before we pull the trigger on any kind of purchase, all right? When decisions come to an impasse, we wait and we pray. If we both don't know what to do, we get counsel outside of our marriage. Typically, our parents offer us a lot of advice. And we ultimately make a decision together. Now, this is important. When we make the decision together, okay, even if it's me initiating it or, or my wife initiating it, we both take responsibility for the win or the loss because we're one. We're one team. So if I was right, I don't go, I told you. <laughs> or if she was wrong, I don't go, you were wrong. I was right. Why? Because we're one team. And if we fail, 
We failed together. We learned from our mistake. Doesn't that sound better than having like records of wins and losses? I know some of you are competitive, okay? And that's fun and all, but you gotta be real careful about keeping those records of right and wrong like that, okay? Let me finish with this. To live as one flesh is a beautiful, powerful harmony to experience. It really is. Can anyone testify in the room today? You know that we get more done because we work together as a team? Do you know that we get things done faster and efficiently because we work together as a team? Do you know that we're less tired because we work together as a team? We have fewer conflicts. By the way, it's taken a lot of walks. How do my wife and I like talk about all these things? We go for walks. We walk in our neighborhood. And we work out a lot of things about the week on our walk. She's like, hey, we got this this week because she, she handles the home personal calendar. She got this, this, all right, all right, I'll get the kids. I'll cook this night. Yeah, we'll have to go out that night. That's what we do on our walks. We don't wait to the last minute because then guess what happens? We start fighting. I thought you put the chicken in the crock pot. No, you were supposed to do it. We never even talked about it, did we? No, we didn't. All right, we both have to go to Chick-fil-A. Hey. <laughs> Chick-fil-A, Jesus chicken, always there except for Sunday. Mm. It's not today, so, but for real, what do we do? We simply serve one another and pick up any slack without keeping records of who does more. Unfortunately, when we were first married, we used to weaponize that. Well, I did this, this, and this. What are you doing this week? Oh, well, we learned to stop doing that because that never got anywhere. Okay, we just, we just take ownership for what needs to be done. Let me, I, I don't know how many times I said, let me finish with this. I am so sorry. Let me say that one more time. Let me finish with this. Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. We have learned that we can't do this on our own, our own power, our own strength. And guess what? Husbands, wives, you don't have to do it on your own. Jesus fills you with everything you need to complete you. Newsflash, you and your spouse don't complete each other. Jesus completes you too. Jesus completes you both. And I I say this, um, you know, I think this is so important. We must be patient with each other. Okay, even with the Lord's help, it takes time to become the marriage that Christ has for us, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. But, but we must, we must apply ourselves, submit, both of us must submit ourselves to Jesus Christ and let him feed us and fill us and complete us. There is no greater relationship right now in this place than your relationship with the Lord. Husbands, you need Jesus. Wives, you need Jesus. When we come together, Man, we're going to be a complete picture. Praise God for that. Let me stand together as we pray. Amen. <laughs> Gentlemen, let's be reminded to lead and serve and to cherish our wives like Jesus cherishes the church. And wives, thank you. Thank you for your yielding at times and your, your teamwork. Thank you for respect and thank you for uh, just always being there, so faithful, so devoted to help us carry this responsibility. It's a beautiful dance. It's a beautiful harmony to experience and I've uh, just seen some amazing mothers in this place today and just so grateful, uh, amazing wives for how you are in your marriage as well. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, that you are over all of us and all that we need is in you. And Lord, I pray you would help us because we can't do this marriage without you. We can't be married without your help the way you called us to be married. Lord, I pray today that Lord, if there's any rewiring that needs to take place in our marriages, that we would both just humble ourselves and remember that we're on the same team. We're not playing against each other. We're playing with each other. We're playing for each other to win together. And we're so grateful that you are our coach 
You're leading the way. You're on our team. God, you are for us. You're not against us. Lord, I pray you would help us to be for each other in marriage, not against each other. God, break down any kind of hostility, any kind of walls. Lord, may humility lead the way. Thank you, God, for the examples that we have in our lives. And for those who have struggled to see those examples or have those examples, Lord, I pray, God, that you would fill in the gaps. Lord, that you would use other families, other mentors, Lord, marriage mentors, our, our marriage group on Wednesday nights to ask questions, to go deeper. Lord, I pray that you would help us to become the complete picture. For those who are seeking, God, I pray they would find someone who loves like Jesus. And that goes for both sides. We all are called to love and submit to Christ. So I pray, Lord, we would look for a future spouse in that way. We love you, God. We give you all the glory and praise for your word today. Thank you, Lord, for this church, receiving it with love and grace and mercy and, Lord, with intentionality. We thank you for that. Help us to apply it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.